Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. So in this video, you know, this is a lecture for watershed engineering principles. And the goal of this lecture is to kind of introduce you to ArcGIS and the different interpolation methods in there. So the learning objectives are, you know, we are going to take some rainfall data and put it in Excel. And then we're going to take this Excel information and move it to ArcGIS Pro. And then the next step is to convert this data that you imported to some GIS fields, right? So it, in a way that the GIS can read and, um, you know, do calculations on it. So we can also, sh I'll also show you how to add a shape file and create a polygon boundary. And then what we'll do is we'll do the interpolation using the decent polygon method, inverse distance variation and creaking okay so you know we've done decent polygon method before so if you know the rainfall coverage what you do is you connect all those points like this and then you draw the perpendicular y sectors right and then those perpendicular y sectors tell you the coverage for each of these data points so essentially you know depending on what this data point is uh, and this area is you can kind of figure out the aerial presentation in that area, right? So we're kind of, uh, you know, not taking the impact of this in this area. We're just using different ways to calculate the overall aerial presentation based on the point data that you're getting. Um, so that way you're getting the average rainfall, right? So uh, that's one of the methods that we did. And I'll show you how to do this in ArcGIS so you don't have to go and draw these figures and stuff. And the next method that we talked about was the inverse distance variation method. So in this method, what happens is we are kind of using the idea that farther a point is away from your um, rainfall gauge, less impact it has, right? So which means this point will have less impact from this point compared to this point. And, you know, this point will have even less impact compared to this point, right? So what it does is it takes one point and then it figures out, okay, what is the impact of the points based on their distance? And we use the weights as the one over d squared, right? So you take the distance, take the inverse, and then square it. So that's why it's inverse distance weighting. Because... Uh, Bigger the distance when you take an inverse, it has less impact, right? Because distance is going to be a big number. So that's one way we'll do. And then the last method is what we call Kriging. So, you know, the, you know, this is showing how Kriging works in general for a random data set of points. So the thing is, you know, if you have all these random points in space at different, um, heat maps, right? So if there are different concentrations for each of them. So what you take from that information is what we call a variogram. So what variogram tells you is what is the variation between all this data. Uh, because, you know, each of them have different numbers. You take this variogram and use that variogram to do some prediction. So this is a bit more mathematical. And there's a lot more uh, information behind it. And, you know, you can read it, read it if you want. But this is supposed to be a lot more accurate, okay? So if you take a look at this and this, these two are pretty close, right? I mean, obviously, it's not exact, but um, this is the given field. And Kriging took those points information. So, in, you know, and then instead of taking the information from the whole field, what it does did was like all the black dots that you see are the values that it took and it kind of predicted the whole map using just those few points right so which is kind of cool and you know it did a pretty good job of matching those two because the the most important thing that we look for is those heat zones so this one kind of matches up with this one this one kind of matches up with this one um you know obviously there's an error uh, because you know, uh, predictions do have errors, but closer you are to the peaks and uh, low points, you are still fine. So like these low points you can see are here. So, you know, you kind of see 
how Krigging works, right? So that's those are the two models that we're going to use, and I mean the three models that we're going to use to um, accomplish these tasks. Okay, so feel free to pause any time that you need to pause because there's going to be a bunch of steps that are time taking. Right, so if you need to install ArcGIS, that's going to take some time. So please uh, pause the video and do the thing that you need to do, then come back, catch up. You know, the, you can take your time doing this, okay? Um, and then, you know, feel free to skip ahead if I'm boring you, right? So, what I'm trying to do is I went to this website, the USGS website, and then you can kind of get the data of your rainfall at different watersheds. So these are the big watersheds uh, in New Jersey. You know, these are all the rain gauges in each of the watersheds. Okay. So, um, you know, Del DRBC, Delaware River Basin is the one that is closer to where we are. And then, and this is also closer to where we are, like the Atlantic coast. So, you know, you can pick one of these, but um, I spent some time because there's a lot of points in this specific hack and sack. So I picked that. Um, what I did was, you know, I kind of took all this information, copy pasted it and deleted all these seven day. I mean, deleted everything else except for the seven day data. Okay. Because, um, you know, I wanted kind of the average information. And some cases I don't even have the data for one and four hours anyway. And in some cases I don't have the data for every 24 hours. So I picked this and I also deleted all the New York gauges because this is in the North area, right? And you know, the other thing I did was because GIS needs the latitude and longitude information so i went here and you know this website is going to change soon so you know i may have to redo this again so you have the latitude and longitude information so if one of the things that we need to do is change these numbers to negative right because this is the best longitude and this is a, this is positive so um east is positive west is negative so um in GIS, uh, you have to input the longitude because, you know, that's how it knows the coordinates of that. So I went to each of them and put the coordinates here. Okay. So I took the time to do all of this, um, yesterday. So that's why this is taking so long. And, you know, because GIS actually needs the decimal points because, you know, when you import this into GIS, what happens is all these data tables get read as text files. So um, GIS cannot use uh, anything text-based, like to do calculations. So what it needs is like a number. So we need to convert all of them to like decimal places. So to convert this to, you know, the decimal places, what I did was I had to go here to this website again. You can Google it, you can use anything you want. So this converts the coordinate system um, NAD83 and uh, so that's a system that's a GPS coordinate system that they utilize right to do this transformation so anyway um, all I did was take the 40 42 17 and then 74 29 46 right 74 29 46 and then say convert to decimal so I copied the 4704 and pasted here, which is what you see there, right? Just to compare. Um, and then the long decimal, longitudinal decimal is the 74.4961, which is that one. So that's all I did. And you know, I did it for about 36 points. And this again includes all the New York, New Jersey, uh, all of those points. So, um, I made the transformation. So this is the file I made yesterday. So all I did was uh, take all of this information, remove the these two things, right? So which is this one. Uh, I will share this file with you guys so you can actually um, use this file, right? And then the I you know these are all the site names, 
So these are all the site names that I have here. And then a precipitation. So I do want to make sure. So one of the things that happened was when I did this copying, um, it put some blank spaces in the end. So I just want to make sure I remove those. So, well, you know, because what it does is it imports these numbers as text files because there is space in the end. So I'm going to make sure. Otherwise, I have to complete an extra step because it, I need to convert all these text boxes as numbers. Okay, so I'm almost done. Maybe I'll edit this out. I don't know. Um, yeah, so these are, let me see if this leads as number. Yeah, so that does lead as a number. And if I do some calculation, max of these numbers is and then min of this list uh, is that. Okay, so th there's a bunch of bit of variability between those numbers, right? So let me delete these things because I'm gonna export all of this into my GIS, okay? So before I start a new file, um, I want to kind of make sure you guys know how to install GIS. Um, so go to this website. So the geography department has uh, a free license for us to use. So I think there's about 2000 licenses that are available to use at any time. So what you do is you're going to install the ArcGIS Pro. Okay. So you have to click that. And then if you have the Roman email address, what it does, it takes you to the Google Drive that has installation file. So click this and it'll install the program. Okay. So once it installs the program, you have to set the license. So the license can be set by picking the concurrent license and pick the advanced and use the license manager as compass.roman.edu. And you know, if you um, have a Windows laptop, you should be able to install this and use this without any issue. It's not that, um, intense, I think. Uh, you know, again, you can tell, let me know if that is how it works. But as long as you're on campus, you can use this. If you're not on campus, you have to set it to authorize to work offline. Okay. Um, other option you can do is you can actually install the VPN, you have to get access to the VPN and, you know, make sure to install that. And, you know, the issue is you can use the Rowan Cloud version, but the Rowan Cloud version, unfortunately, doesn't give you access to the spatial tools. Um, I tried doing this. I couldn't figure it out. So if somebody knows, let me know. Um, that would make it a lot easier because you could just work on cloud. Uh, that's a bit slower, but you know, you just deal with it, but you don't have to install anything on your computer. But once you do this, um, you can just open ArcGIS Pro and you should be able to like, uh, see some, not something like this, you know, I'll cut back to it. I kind of left this open because, you know, I kind of wanted to show you guys what we will be creating. So this is a piece of polygon and, you know, this is the inverse distance variation and this is a gradient. Okay. So those are the three things that we'll do. All right. So when you open the thing, you can go to new. It'll give you like a option to create a new project. Um, so what we'll do is you can create like a new map or you can say start without a template. E either one is fine. And then I'm going to save changes to my rainfall data and you know, um, so if you start without a template, it'll look like this. So what you have to do is you can just add a map. So just add new map and you know, it'll add like a basic version of your map here. Okay. So this is the topographic map. And then, you know, you can just uh, zoom in to New Jersey. Okay. So this is kind of where we would be working mostly. So you can also add 
other kinds of base maps so you know if you want to work on maybe streets map so you can use that map you know if that's something you're more comfortable with so you set the map and then the next thing you are going to do is um, add data okay so you can just say add data here and uh, so there's a bunch of things that we can do so this is my shape file so i saved all my shape files here and you know you can add the shape file if you want so what it does is um, it adds the watershed management areas in new jersey okay so if you see here this has this weird um filled in thing right so i can change that so i can go to symbology and change the symbology to a black outline okay so that way you just see that black outline so i'm not gonna like really use this shape file it is just there for me to see where the boundaries are okay uh, i can turn off this this map the world street map uh, because once i input the data kind of want to see where they fall and you know use that as a way to draw my boundary okay i mean because it's the whole state of new jersey and not one specific file uh and you know i kind of want to like not use this and make my own boundary uh you know where that has its own uses anyway so let's keep this in the background and then what we'll do is we'll add some data okay so for for me my excel file that i want to export is here in my watershed folder right so what i do is i go to this for gis and make sure you close the thing so this is not the one that i'm trying to export but this is the one right i said for gis these are all the values that i want to export right and you know make sure you put the negative symbol also if you don't put the negative symbol before your longitude it is going to put somewhere in the middle of uh, europe or asia so make sure you do that and then you close this okay so just close it and then i can go to for gis what it does is it gives me the um, sheet name. Um, in my Excel file, it was called rainfall, the sheet name. So I can pick that. So if your Excel file has a typical sheet one, sheet two, sheet three, then you may see them here. Okay. So you see the standalone tables. Okay. So what you want to do first is just say open let me put my watershed map back again okay so you see here the first thing you want to make sure uh, is that it imported all this information correctly which is you want to make sure the latitude is a double type okay so if you see here when you hover on top of lat it says type is double what that means is double is a floating point number so floating uh if you remember your programming if you've done any programming so integer is int and then float is usually like a decimal point number so if you have decimal points in your numbers it's float and those floating point numbers can either be single digit single precision or double precision so double precision has like uses like 32 bit or 16 bit um format so you can get more precise you know decimal points uh the way the computer works is it converts everything to binary numbers and then it converts back to the decimal numbers right so um, when it does that conversion if you give it uh much better bits more bits like 
double it does more accurate conversion that's why you get less round up error anyway so the so what we should be doing here is making sure that all the numbers are numbers okay so which is lat is type double which is good long is also type double which is great site name is text which is good precipitation is also double so um, that's all we need right so now all i want to do is take this information and put it on my uh, map right so let's do that so let's go and say display xy data so what it does is it opens this thing on the side that says geoprocessing okay let me move myself out of the way so it takes the input table which is rainfall right all my information is in rainfall um it is putting it out to output feature class rainfall xy table point so i can just call this precipitation okay i can just say any precipitation northeast precipitation so x field is my longitude and y field is my latitude okay and the coordinate system has to be gcs w at gs1984 so um that's when they kind of uh you know mapped all the whole world and gave them like specific coordinates using the gps satellite so um you know all the all these numbers are actually nad 1983 so north american datum 1983 so uh, and then gcs i think is the global world what is it so it's some global world uh coordinate system so that's you know they're both all the world global coordinate system so those two are kind of the same thing so if you have the nad system you can just use the wgf um, if you have a different coordinate system, you can pick that coordinate system. Okay, so we're going to use WGS1984 and pick that. So now all you have to do is click the run button at the bottom, which is at the bottom here. So you run it and you don't have to set a Z field. Okay, so now you see here it put all the points here, right? So that's where all my rain gauges are. They're all in this. Uh, Milford, Ringwood, all those areas. Okay, now I can turn off the Wall Street maps. So I just have that. And then, you know, the other thing I can do is, you know, close this thing and check the attribute table. So go to attribute table, check and make sure you have all of them correctly. Okay, so you have the latitude double, site name text. And then presentation as well. So the cool thing you can do is you can pick the point. Um, so let me turn off the watershed management. You can click the point. It tells you, okay, this is the Charles Pittsburgh USGS unheated rain gauge, New Jersey. Uh, its latitude is that, longitude is that, site name is that, and presentation is that. So this is how you can take any information in a spreadsheet and bring it to the gis and you know because we exported it nicely here um it can show us the information right and also uh you know you should get used to how this is kind of ordered so i can delete this so i don't get confused and it doesn't get confused right so i can also close this uh, and also a good habit to save once in a while. So I'll save my project as um, watershed information. Or something like that. Okay, I'll just let me create a new folder here. Watershed. And then uh, rainfall and save. Okay. 
So uh, it'll save that project. All right. So you have those data points. Okay. And you know, if you click anything, you can get that information. And you know, if you don't like the way these look, you can go to the symbology, uh, change the colors. I have to pick this to get the symbology. Even, even I have to get used to this whole thing, right? So I click that thing. I can pick anything actually. So, um, if I want, then, you know, I'll pick, uh, circles are fine. Like this circle is fine. I can go to properties. And you know, I can actually enable scale sizing. What that means is, uh, you know, depending on the number, it may have less size or big, bigger size. But you know, let me, uh, not do that so it's more consistent. So because these are all rain gauges, I can make them blue or something and then make it that size. Right? Make it six. And let me close this. So, so you, you have that, right? And then what I'll do is I'll put that map back. Okay. So what we're going to do now is create a polygonal boundary. Okay. So, you know, there's a bunch of watersheds here, right? So these are, uh, so this is the Northeast Wallkill watershed and this is your fountain. And this is your lower Passaic saddle. And this is your Hackensack. Uh, and this is your upper Passaic. So I can, you know, create a boundary that is kind of, you know, going across this area, right? So that includes all these one, two, three, four, and five. So I can make up a, a boundary that includes these five things. Okay. To do that, what I have to do is I have to go and I have to add some polygons. Okay. Um, to do that, let me find my table again. So I have to get the catalog pane again. You know, if you lose the catalog pane, just go to view and go to catalog pane. Okay. So what I'll do is go to my databases. Okay. So I'm going to create a new, um, see this database essentially sh sh stores all your points here. All right. So everything that we're doing on this screen is stored here and you know, there could be some things here that you created, but you may not be using in your map, right? So it, then you have to bring it here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new, uh, feature class. Okay. So what that does is it create, you know, we're going to create a boundary and then using the poly polygon tool. So that is what I'm going to do here. So that will come from this feature class. So I will add a new feature class here and the feature class type is a polygon. Okay. Because I'm going to draw a boundary. So that boundary is a polygon. So I'm going to call this watershed boundary. Okay. Uh, leave these alone. Don't change anything here. And then you don't need to change anything there. Um, you know, you can use the same GCS W84, right? And use that coordinate system. You do that there. You do, uh, again, you know, this is essentially telling you what is the pixel, each pixel count and all that. So, um, accuracy, resolution and all that. Ch don't change any of those. Um, same thing, configuration, and you can just say finish here. Okay. So this watershed boundary is here. Okay. Which means I need to add it here to the map. I created this thing 
I need to add it to my current map. So all I have to do is right click and say current map. Okay. So the watershed boundary is not created yet. I mean, we created a class that says watershed boundary, but the watershed boundary itself has not been created yet. So to do that, what I have to do is go to edit and you can create a new polygon. All right. So what you'll do is when you're ready, just go to edit and then say create. And what you want to do is we're creating a polygon tool in the watershed boundary, right? So pick the watershed boundary. Uh, see, there's different things, Northeast Precipitation, Watershed Management, and Watershed Boundary. So we're going to make this thing in the watershed boundary. So I'm going to follow this path right here. So you can see it's trying to make a nice polygon. So like I said, I want to make sure I include all these. I'm sure, you know, there's probably an easier way to do it. And if there's an easier way to do this, let me know. Uh, but this is the one that I found um a way to do that i can actually keep it in between certain points and all that so i'm going to like you know not spend not be like super particular about the way this is going and I, I know i'm not following all the points there right but you know you get the idea right so what i'm trying to do is kind of go along these points and make sure all of those points are enclosed or at least i'm kind of doing enough to enclose all those points okay go here go here go here go here go back go up here 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 so when you're ready to be done uh just double click okay double click and it should be done it should close your loop now I have a boundary for my watershed, right? So I can turn off this watershed management area. So this is my watershed boundary. And you know, I can go back to my symbology again. Um, okay, let me save this. Okay, so you have to save it. So make sure you hit the save button there. Once you're done creating the boundary, just hit save. Okay, so map, go back to map and hit the select tool so you can actually get the arrow back. So go to watershed boundary, like I said, and go to symbology for the watershed. And, you know, what you want to do is uh, turn this boundary to just black, right? Um, so the indoor color is outline color is black and we want it to have approximately maybe a couple of points of width so that's what it should look like okay so and then click outside so you have a nice polygonal boundary for your um data points okay so if you want to see the watershed management again so that, you know just just to kind of get an idea of what it is looks like excuse me okay so we have the boundary and we have the data points now we can go ahead and start um start you know doing our interpolation all right so to do our interpolations, what we need to do is go to the analysis, okay? And then in the analysis, pick the tools and say, you want to do polygon, right? Decent polygon first. So we can do create decent polygons. So all my input features are here right so i can change the any presentation
Okay, and then go to environments. So what we want to do is make sure everything is kind of um, limited to the watershed boundary, right? So we want to make sure the coordinate system is same as that. And we want to make sure the extent essentially tells you up to what point it can, um, what is the boundary up to which it has to go, okay? So just pick those two. And you know, once you specify the extent, it automatically picks the coordinates for that. Uh, and you know, you don't have to change anything else. So just run it. And what it does is it creates these decent polygons that are there. Yes, right? So you can see the decent polygons are there. Uh, if I were to put my watershed boundary back up here, you will see that uh, this is my, I mean, you know, this is another thing that you guys should learn, which is whichever is above, displace first. Okay, so, um, you know, if I put my watershed boundary at the top, it will always be visible. Okay, and, you know, this, this is fine, right? I mean, if you really want these in polygons, you can kind of see, yes, it's going out of your lines, but it's there. I mean, you should be okay with that. But what we can actually do is we can make this a bit better, right? Which is, uh, I, you really don't like these lines going out of your, let's say I put my watershed boundaries back, you can kind of see that it actually goes beyond New Jersey and all that. And it doesn't look that great. So what I can do is I can clip, uh, go to tools again, and then go to clip and say clip layer okay um, so what it what this does is it extract input features from within specified polygon so you just go to clip layer and it will take you to the clip layer box you click it so your input layer is your decent polygon and the clip layer is going to be your watershed boundary. So you can just say in any precipitation decent polygon clip or something like that. that. That way, you know, we can put it in a separate area, right? So the, just think about it. You're giving it this whole rectangular box and you want it to make sure that it only shows you what's in between these lines. Okay, just go run it. And it's running here. So once it finishes, it'll clip and it'll let us know. So now I can go ahead and turn off this. Uh, See, whatever you turn on and off, you will see those, right? So you can just turn off this any precipitation piece in polygon. Now you have this nicely clipped area, okay? So I can, again, go back and go to the symbology of this. If you want, don't want any colors of that, you can do that. And if you want to show all the piece in polygons in red, and you can just go ahead and apply. So you can see how uh, nicely it actually comes out, right? So these are your piece and polygons um, for all of your watershed, okay? For the given uh, rainfall information, these are your piece and polygons. Hopefully, you know, you can kind of get what we're doing and I'm hoping I'm not going too fast. If I am, just let me know. The The goal is to make sure that, you know, you kind of know how easy these things can be done. And it, you know, it's easy now because I figured out how to do this. But it take, takes a while for you to uh, actually, you know, go through this whole thing, right? So you can see my database has the all of those things that I made, right? So it will, you know, the... All of them are stored, they're all here, and you know, you can delete all of them if you don't want them to be here, and you can still 
um, have all that information because the database still has that, right? Okay. So I'm not using the world street map, but you know, if I ever want to show it, I can show it, right? It's there. Um, I'm not using the watershed map, but if I ever want to show it, it's there. And this is the actual piece of polygons that I created. And this is the rainfall information. And this is the watershed boundary <coughs> that I created. Um, and this is the clipped polygons. All right, makes sense. Okay. So the next thing we'll do is the inverse. I keep closing that and then I have to go back. So the next thing we'll do is the IDW method. Okay. To do the IDW method is, uh, you know, there's two ways to do it. One is you can go to analysis and then you start the geostatistical wizard. So when you do the geostatistical wizard, um, you know, you, it'll bring up all these options. So one of those options is inverse distance weighting and then the other option is the creating that you can do. You can also do other kinds of interpolations if you want. But um, what we will really want to do here is that we want to kind of see and take this information and make sure you clip it to your data, right? So when I did this, I was not able to set the extent for all these things. So what we have to do is go to my tools again. And instead of picking the geoanalytical tools, I have to pick the spatial statistics tool. Not spatial, so spatial analyst tools. And go to interpolation. Okay. So both IDW and Kriging are here. You can pick one of them. There's also natural neighbor. So IDW, if you click it, it gives, asks you what are your input features. So my input feature is the presentation and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, interpolate for the latitude, right? I'm trying to interpolate for the presentation data. So <clears throat> once it, you know, completes it, it needs to know where it needs to go, right? So I, I can just say any precipitation. So it puts all that information in that place. Okay. So, and then you go to environments. We have to do the same thing again. The output coordinate system has to be clipped to the watershed boundary, right? Um, there are no transformation. The, uh, I mean, the output coordinate system is using the GCS, WCS. So it has to use the same, um, coordinate system as what the watershed boundary has. And this is where we go and tell it exactly where it needs to clip, right? So the extent of interpolation is also watershed boundary. Okay. And you ha also have to tell it to mask it at the watershed boundary. What mask does is it actually makes sure, you know, whatever is there, it is not exceeding. Okay. So instead of doing it and clipping it again, um, you can just tell it here to just mask it to watershed boundary. You know, if you're more curious, just press this I button here and read what masking is. Um, it'll only consider those cells that fall within the analysis mark of this operation. So it'll essentially do within that area. You know, I said the extent and then everything is set. Um, you know, there's nothing else that we need to do here. So the other thing is, you know, you can change the power. So if you guys remember when we did IDW, we took D square, right? So that's where this power is. And you can also set, change the search radius to variable and fix. Um, Let's, you know, you can try variable first and see what happens. The, the cool thing about these things is, uh, they're so fast to run. Okay. And you can kind of, you know, it only takes one button to get that, right? So you can see here when I did IDW interpolation, this is what it looks like. Okay. Um, you know, don't worry about 
the warning and all that. Uh, that's one of the things I talked about was that it will have these areas that, you know, because its impact wanes as it goes away, you can kind of see that, you know, the impact of this area is much more concentrated closer to that box than in other places, right? So you get these like points that look like heat maps. So, you know, some people like it and some people don't like it. So what you can do is same thing we've been doing before. Uh, go to symbology and, you know, th those things will still remain. Only thing I want to do is I want to make sure that this variation is kind of at somewhat equal intervals, right? So um, we want to pick classify and the method has to be equal intervals, okay? And then you can also pick the color scheme. So I like going with the, the red, red one or this red. So, you know, you can kind of see the higher values are kind of marked red. In some cases, you may also want to pick the bathmetric, uh, information, but that kind of looks I mean, you can always change the color that you want. So, uh, oddly enough, the lighter blues are the one that have higher concentrations. Okay. So that's why it looks like that. So you can always change this to darker blue and all that. But to quickly show what's going on, this is what it, it looks like. The, I mean, I prefer this because, um, you can kind of see that the red ones are the big numbers and the green ones are the low numbers, okay? So all the red numbers have pockets that are really, really close that are giving it a lot more impact. The low numbers have, you know, a higher impact because, I mean, this number has a much bigger impact because these two are high. Uh, so, and most of these points are really low, so those have more impact compared to this. So. Even you know, because you know it uses like the nearest neighboring points to get this information. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So this is how we do IDW. Okay, um, and the next thing we'll do is the Krieging. Okay, so Krieging is same as IDW. So you go to Tools and pick Krieging here. And then same, we'll do this. But before we do all that, I kind of want to show you using the geostatistical wizard, the way you can actually see the different parameters. So creaking can be done as co creaking You know, you can use the rainfall information in one field and then you can also look at the another data set. So if you have elevation variation also, you can kind of incorporate that in here. Okay. So what we do here next is go back and hit next. Okay. We are going to click for presentation, right? So, uh, you can use different kinds of Krieging. Okay, so I mean, you can look up what each of these mean, but you know, simple pr prediction is you know the most easiest, or ordinary Krieging prediction is also the most easiest one. So you can pick these, one of these, but really not necessary. So the Uh, again, you, you know, it's, it, this is kind of defining the area where it's looking for, uh, copy of aerogram is true. And then you go to next. What here you can kind of see the errors and distribution and QQ plot. So all these are kind of showing you, giving you an idea of how the distribution is there. Okay. And really the most important thing that we need to be looking at is the aerogram. 
Okay, so the variogram essentially tells you how much variation is there between the data. And you know, you the the way you should think about variogram is um let me go back here. So th think about it as if you're in the middle of an ocean, right? And as you go farther away, um in you know, in the middle of the ocean there is the deepest and deepest of the waters, right? Let's say you're floating on the top. And as you swim away from the middle, you will still have less variation in depth, right? As you go maybe five feet swimming across, then you still have some variation. So let me maybe plot this here and kind of show you. So let's say this is my ocean here. and you are at the center of this ocean right here somewhere, right? Let's say you're at the center here somewhere. Okay, that's kind of the center, and I'll put this as black. So that's the ocean, and you know, it's the deepest part. Uh, and then let me also insert like a colon or something. So you can kind of see the okay, uh, and then let me cut this. Put it over here. So, you know, we can kind of talk about this as we go here. All right. So, what's going on here is your center is at the deepest part, right? So, as you go away from the center, you know, your depth is kind of changing in all directions the same way, right? No matter which way you go, your direction changes the same way. So, when you go from here to here, the change in depth is not that much. Right, does that true? So let me draw a line, maybe attach a line to this thing and see if that helps. Uh, I have to make sure this is bring it forward and then change this to black and kind of make these two a group. Ah, I'm doing it on the fly. Okay, so you can see as I move farther away, my depth is changing slightly, right? Which is what this is showing you here. As I move farther away from the center, my depth is slowly changing. When I go to the end of the map, it changes, right? It keeps changing. And there is a point where you probably hit the shore and it doesn't change anymore, right? So, it, it kind of is talking about how there is variation in data, okay? So, all this is doing is as you go away from the center back and forth, you're kind of seeing a change in the depth. That's all this is doing, all right? So, let's go back and see what my variogram looks like. So, if I go to my... Uh, GIS, you can kind of see that there are a lot of points and their average variogram kind of looks like this, right? So it's not perfect. So you can kind of change some of these things and you can kind of optimize the model to get a much better fit for my variogram. So, you know, you can also use a covariance, but variogram is a much better way of doing this. So this is how you can see the variation in your data and get a general idea of what your uh, difference look, uh, rainfall data is looking like. So, you know, but when I do this, I'm not able to clip it to a certain extent. Um, I don't know if there is a way to do it. So I am not using this method. So what I'll do is, um, 
Okay. So I, you know, because I have to clip it to a boundary, I'm using this geoprocessing tool. Okay. Uh, instead of using the geostatistical wizard. So again, same thing. My input features are precipitations. I'm trying to interpolate for precipitation. So I can just say any precipitation, right? And you know, we're going to do ordinary clicking that way. I don't have to like add, give it a bunch of information that I need to give. And we can leave the way search radius as variable. And you know, you can always, if you want to figure out what each of these things mean, you can go back and read all of this. Essentially, you know, uh, you just want to make sure you're following some kind of pattern, right? And then I'm going to use the same output system as my watershed boundary which was the gcs wgs and my extent has to be clipped to the watershed boundary right so i want to make sure that whatever i'm getting is in between these points okay and then i have to uh i don't want to snap the raster to anything i want to again mask it also to the watershed boundary so when it produces the data, it makes sure that it is only giving me the information within this boundary, right? So all I have to do now is press this run button. All right. Okay, so let me turn off the IDW here so I can see my rigging. So I can go back and change my symbology again. So instead of geometric interval, I go to equal intervals. I go to 10 points. I think I did 10 points and I'm going to use the color scheme that I used for the other one, which is this. So now you can see this is vastly different from this, right? So if I turn this off and turn this on, you can see that there's like all these heat maps, right? So you can see this. You see those bullseyes that are like showing you, okay, clearly showing you, oh, my influence is here, my influence is here. It is not taking any of the total variability into account. Whereas this method is actually, it feels a lot more smooth and a lot more realistic, right? Because it has incorporated all the variation into the chart, right? So, you know, again, the demarcations are pretty there still. So, for example, you can see that there's like straight lines and all that. So, if you want, you can always go back and change the kind of uh, rigging you're doing. So, instead of spherical, you can do Gaussian and run it again. Right? That looks a bit different, right? Uh, so, you know, go back to symbology again, change the symbology to 10 and equal intervals, and change this to that. So, you know, you can do different things and see which one kind of looks better. I think they kind of both look the same to me. So, I, I wish I had saved both. But, yeah, I mean, just check with each of these things and then you also have the piece and polygons here right which is at the top that we have been displaying there so you have piece and polygons and then you have the rigging so uh, there is some correlation between rigging and piece and polygons right so you can see there's more th there's still this block this you know if you see this polygon here has multiple rainfall information instead of one single rainfall, right? But these ones, because there's only one rainfall point or rain gauge here, that has more influence. So it would be more helpful if you had another rain gauge here so you get more information. Uh, I mean, you know, you can always check for the whole map, right? Okay, so I can also change the base map to uh, something with imagery and see if that kind of gives me a better idea. 
So yeah, I mean, this is how you use GIS. Okay. Uh, GIS is really, really powerful and you can do a lot of things really, really quickly. Uh, but you know, it takes some time to figure it out and mapping all these variables and, you know, figuring out all the tool sets and making sure you're masking it correctly and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, the purpose of this exercise is to show you that what we're doing by hand is actually done at a diff higher scale here, right? So that's what we will um, do. And for this class, uh, what we'll do is you have to replicate this, uh, this whole exercise. And I'll let you know what output do I require. And the other thing I will be asking you is to pick three different I mean, five different points from your rainfall and, you know, draw their catchment and use that information to give me that, you know, same kind of three different kinds of rainfalls. Okay. I mean, hopefully you learn something, right? That's kind of the purpose of this whole exercise. Um, so please let me know if you need anything. And, you know, you, all I want from you guys is to make sure you attempt to do this uh, if you have any issues please let me know and i'm happy to help you um, thank you for watching um, and then please reach out to me if you have any questions bye